together. Father, that is our desire. It is our desire that you have all of our heart. There is no area in our life that is withheld from you. That everything we know is open and laid bare before your eyes, as the scripture says. And so, Father, this morning as we deal with that issue of honesty, really that's at the foundation of our giving of our heart to you. And so we pray today that as, as we yield our hearts to you, as we look at this issue of, of um, being honest before you, being honest before others, that we would, um, we would see a, a deeper understanding of what that means in our lives and what it, the, the implications of that and the impact that it makes on others as well. And so, Father, this morning, as always, we commit our time to you now. We pray that we would give you our undivided attention that you, as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and that we would be those who yield our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The children may be dismissed, and the sound team can roll off the... I'm getting some feedback up here somewhere. I'm not sure if it's the microphone. How's that? Oh, that's even better now. They totally, they totally cut me off. That's great. Yeah, everybody's going, yeah, there we go. Now that's the way I want it. His lips are moving, but I can't hear him. Praise God. No. All right, we are in James chapter 5 this morning. And my lights aren't on. Can you flip on that other light or turn up the thing on it? There we go. Thank you. Now I can see too. James chapter 5, verse 12, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. I want to welcome everybody who's on our live stream this morning and on our YouTube channel. Um, we're going to be looking at this one verse. It's interesting that during the week, a lot of times, I'll listen to other pastors and listen to the sermons and all that, and I don't really hear a sermon on this too much anymore, and yet I think it's very pertinent to the times in which we live. James in chapter 5, verse 12 says, But above all, brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Four college friends had decided that they were going to take a road trip and party for the weekend rather than study for their final exam. I haven't even gotten there yet. Who's laughing about this, you know? Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. And as a result of it, they didn't make it back in time for their final exam. So knowing that they would fail their exam, fail their class, if they didn't have a good excuse, they thought, well, we're going to concoct some story and see if the professor will, will let us take the final exam later. So they told the professor, look, you know, we had to go out of town, and, and we were on our way back, and we had this flat tire, and, and we looked in the car that we were driving. There wasn't a spare tire in there, and it took us hours to get another tire, and so that's, that's why we were late. That's why we couldn't make it back for the exam. And so, to their surprise, the professor graciously agreed and says, yeah, I, I certainly understand. Look, you can take, all, all four of you can just take the exam tomorrow. And so that night, all the four friends, they, they got together and they, they studied hard for the final exam. And the next day, they arrived in the professor's office and they're ready and they're confident for their exam. And the professor says, all right, I'm going to put each of you in separate rooms to take this exam. And so they go to their separate rooms. And the problem on the first page was worth five points. And they, they look, you know, each of them looks at that problem. Oh, this is an easy answer. Oh, we're just going to ace this exam. And they're, you know, they're inside, they're sort of amused. Hey, the professor fell for our story. You know, all of our friends were spending the whole weekend, you know, studying for this exam. And, you know, we, we partied out through the weekend. And now, you know, all we had to do was spend one night studying. And, and, and they're just really excited about this, that they got away with this. And it was funny until they turned to the second page of the exam. <clears throat> And it said this, on the second question, this question is worth 95 points in the rest of the exam. What tire was it? <laughs> <laughs> to quote Moses, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, there are times if we are dishonest, it's going to be found out. Dishonesty will catch up with us sooner or later. James warns his readers about making false oaths or dishonest, oath, dishonest oaths. <clears throat> you know, when we give somebody our word, we need to keep it. Unfortunately, many people today think nothing about lying to others or, or deceiving others. Even those who believe that it is wrong have found a way to sort of sugarcoat it. 
You ever heard somebody say, well, it, it, it's no big deal, it was just a little white lie? It wasn't a black lie, it wasn't even a chartreuse lie, it was just a little white lie, as if that's a better lie than any other lie. Or did you ever hear someone say, well, I, I didn't really lie to them, I was just stretching the truth. Exactly how do you stretch the truth? You know, a research project by the American Psychological Association, um, it revealed that the average American lies about something approximately 11 times a week. Now think about that, that's more than once a day we're lying about something. Dishonesty has become an accepted practice in our society, in our culture. A Gallup poll that was released in 2020 rated the professionals most likely to be considered honest. Now this might not surprise you, in some ways it's a little surprising to me, but who was rated as the most honest professional in the United States? It was nurses. And for 18 years in a row, nurses have been considered the most honest profession with a rating of 85%. So way to go, nurses. Engineers were second at 66%, doctors 65%, pharmacists at 64%. Members of Congress were second to last. <laughs> and that surprised me because I thought they should have been last. They said that there was only one less reliable than people in Congress and that was used car salesmen. Now I'll trust a used car salesman before I trust most congressmen. You know. To understand this exhortation from James uh, about making oaths, about keeping our word, um, we need to sort of understand a little bit of the historical background at the time that James wrote this. In the Jewish world, there was a distinction between an oath that was binding and an oath that was not binding. Now, that may seem strange to us today, but that was the mentality back then in the Jewish culture. Any oath in which the name of God was directly used was considered binding. But if you didn't use, directly use the name of God in your oath, then it was non-binding. According to the Jews, once God's name was used in that oath, he was considered to be an active partner or participant in that oath, and therefore that oath had become binding. Now, as a result of that practice, it became a matter of, of skill and cleverness to, to speak an oath in which it, the wording sounded sincere, but in reality, it was not actually binding. And this would often involve an oath where it didn't actually use the name of God, it would use something close to it. And that's why they would talk about swearing by heaven, or by earth, or, or by Jerusalem, or by the temple. And so it sounded spiritual, but it didn't specifically mention the name of God, and so it wasn't binding. And that practice made a mockery of confirming any type of agreement with an oath. It, be just, it became meaningless. And during the time of Jesus in the early church, the making of oaths had become so, such a common practice. The fact that oaths had become such a commonplace was a problem. And James addresses that here. Uh, in an honest society, no oath is needed. A person's word is their bond. And many of us remember, I remember my grandfather, you know, when he gave his word to somebody, he didn't need to, it didn't need to be put in writing. If he told somebody he was going to do something, he was going to do it. And you could, you know, it was better than any contract. And, you know, it's crazy, the contracts we get today, you know. Um, a while back, my wife and I um, sold our house, one of our houses, and, um, and, and we had to fill out all the paperwork and all the things that you have to sign. Have anybody buy a house recently or sell a house? And, you know, you got a stack, like, you know, that would choke a dinosaur. And I'm like, you know, and you don't read through anything, do you? You're just like, eh, eh, like, eh, like, eh, like eh. what am I signing here? You know, I don't know what I'm signing here. And, all that. and I come to one of them, and I said, what's this sign? And this says, well, this is signing, you're signing to say that what you're signing is really your signature. Well, it's like, well, what if this isn't my signature and I'm signing something in my signature? Does that really make any difference? And she just looks at me like, you're not supposed to ask that question. I don't know how to answer that question, you know? I mean, it's just crazy, but that's how the type of society we've gotten into right now. And during the time of Jesus, you know, it was such a common practice. And it was, it's only the people that you can't trust who, who really, you know, want to make oaths a lot of times. You know, we've all met people who are constantly, you know, swearing to us about how much they're going to tell the truth. Hey, man, lend me 20 bucks. I'll, I'll pay you back next week when I get paid. Swear to God, swear to God, swear to God. You know, and that's sort of their attitude. You know, if someone has to swear to God that many times that they're going to pay me back, I am never going to see that money again. 
you know, it is, it is gone. It is like said goodbye to me and it's long gone. I probably won't even see that person again. So, you know, it's one of those things, but when a person feels that need to swear an oath to me, that even makes me more suspicious because all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, why are they doing this? You know, are they not that trustworthy? The fact that James must make this exhortation to believers indicates that there's a problem. Now, in the first century, taking oaths was looked down upon not only by religious people, it was even looked down by the, the secular people. Uh, the Jewish rabbis would say, accustom yourself not to vows, for sooner or later you will, you will swear a false oath. The Essenes, now the Essenes were a very strict Jewish sect. You know, you had your Pharisees, the Sadducees. The Essenes were very extremely strict. Um, the Essenes were the ones who basically lived out in Qumran, where, where basically where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And, and they said that they forbid any kind of oath because they believed that if an oath was required of a man, he was already considered untrustworthy. The Greeks believed that the best guarantee of any statement was not the oath itself, but the character of the one who made it. And the idea that we should live our lives you know, in such a way, that's the, the idea that they had, was you're supposed to live your life in such a way that no one would ever demand an oath from you because you live above reproach. Now, there's a, this is interesting, this statement that James gives. Now, remember, this is James. This is the brother of Jesus. And evidently, when Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, that made an impact on James because James is almost quoting what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, almost word for word. Because here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make any oath on your head, for you cannot make one hair black or white, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is evil. Now, I find that interesting what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount because he deals with that deceptive practice of making a vow that sounded spiritual, that sounded sincere, but wasn't really. He made it clear that any time you give your word, it's binding. You know, because he says, because, you know, you say, well, you're going to make it by heaven. And you're thinking, well, that's not going to be binding because I didn't use the name of God in it. Well, he says, well, heaven is the throne of God. He says, well, oh, I'm going to make it by earth. Well, earth is the footstool of God. Well, I'm going to make it by Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem's the city of God. So anytime you make an oath, anytime you give your word, by virtue of the fact that you're giving your word and you say you're a believer, you are bringing God into that agreement. Believers are to be known as men and women of their word, with or without any need for an oath. So James tells us that that. God takes this matter very seriously. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Because look at this verse as we break it down. James begins by saying, but above all, my brother. Now let's stop right there for a second. The word James uses, but, is a transitional word. Um, it could also be, you know, he could have put an and, meaning that he's just continuing a thought. Or, or now, meaning, okay, we're going to transition to a slightly new thought or whatever. But it's, it's not a contrast here when he says but. He's not saying, well, this, but, that. He's not contrasting. He's just sort of moving into a transition to another statement. And this is going to be the first of several exhortations that James gives us before he wraps up his letter. This exhortation may seem insignificant because it's only one verse. So, so, you know, what's the big deal? But James gives it a prominent position in his exhortations when he says, above all. Some of your versions may say, first of all. Basically, what it's saying is, of the most prominence right now. And so he's saying, in a sense, don't miss this point. This is very important. Make this a priority. And notice that James makes it clear he's speaking to believers. He says, brethren. And I like the way that that word is used, because if you think about the context in which he uses it, he's not lording himself over other people saying, hey, you know, you need to do this. You know, I'm above this. I don't do this. You need to do this. He's sort of including himself in it. But he's saying, brethren. Now, why is honesty such an important matter for believers? Because it's the one characteristic that distinguishes believers from unbelievers, or one of them at least. We tell others that we have the truth, that we know the only way to eternal life. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
He didn't say, well, I am one of many truths. He didn't say, well, I speak the truth. He said, I am the truth. I heard a pastor that I know on the radio this morning. I was just listening to him when I was driving in. And he said in a recent survey among people who claim to be born again Christians. Now, I want you to hear that. Among people who claim to be born again Christians, 70% in that poll said that they did not believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven. You know what I say to those people? You better start reading your Bible. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If that's not good, you go into the book of Acts. Acts 4.12, where Peter says, um, And there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Now, you know, I know that we live in a society now of inclusiveness and equity and all these types of things and all these little buzzwords and all that. But you know what? Truth is truth. And Jesus said, not, if it's not through me, you're not getting to heaven. And that's what the scripture says. And it's not what I say. It's what he, he says. But Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth. You know, we serve a heavenly father who James describes as the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And that tells me that he is full light, that there is no shadow in what he says. There's no hidden, no fine print, nothing, you know, hidden in what God says to us. But, you know, it's interesting because the antithesis of that, Jesus speaks in John chapter 8 of Satan, of the devil, as the father of lies. You know, when we are truthful and honest, we demonstrate that we are children of our Heavenly Father. But to be dishonest with others dishonors God and will cause others to question our faith. Well, wait a minute. They say they serve the true and living God, but I can't even trust their word. So our honesty and our integrity, think about this for a second. It has an eternal impact on other people. What we say to other people and the way that we live our lives the honesty and the integrity with which we live our lives will impact other people because they will look at our lives. And if they don't see honesty and integrity in our lives, guess what? They're not going to believe the gospel, and that's going to have an eternal impact upon them. So that's the importance that James gives. Now, he gives this restriction. He says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Now, when James speaks about swearing here, he's not talking about using profanity. He's not talking about what's going to happen in a couple weeks when Mark eats that piece of chocolate, okay? You know, no, I'm, I'm kidding. He won't say anything, I hope. Uh, but when James speaks about swearing, um, it's not profanity. Now, the other day, you know, it's sort of funny because, again, I work as a chaplain with Stafford County Fire and Rescue, and, and firefighters are known for flowery language, creative language, right? And so I was talking to one of them, and they're like, you know, I tell you what, that beep 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 beep, and then there was a sudden pause, and they went, "Oh, sorry, chaplain. Excuse my French." I said, "I know French. That's not French." <laughs> you know, while the passage isn't talking about profanity, please let me understand. I'm not promoting profanity either. You know, I mean, you know, Ephesians, Paul says, let no unwholesome word proceed from our mouth. So, you know, we need to be careful about it. And, and that's not, when it says unwholesome word, that's not even just profanity, but anything where it's not edifying to other people. You know, criticism or gossip or things like that, that is unwholesome speech. And so that's not supposed to come out of our mouth. But this command by James, um, it brings up a question that a lot of people ask me when, when they look at this topic or when they look at this passage, and they'll say, well, let me ask you something. Can a Christian take an oath in court? You know, where it says, well, to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. You know, can a Christian take an oath like that in court, or is that a violation of Scripture? I want to touch on that for a minute. There's a great debil, debate, um, deal debate over this issue. Let me just say that. You know, there, there are different Christians who have different views of this, and some people are like, you know, you should never take any oath. That's what the Bible says. It's very clear about that. And there's other people who say, no, that's not what it's talking about here. That's not in the context. I personally believe that taking an oath in court is not violating the intent of this passage. <clears throat> we know in several places that God swore oaths in the Bible when he made promises to people. Um, in Luke's gospel, he refers to an oath which he swore to Abraham, uh, Luke chapter 1. When the Israelites tested God in the wilderness, he said, I swore in my wrath that I would not let them enter my rest. He swore to them. In Hebrews, we're told that God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So I don't think, at least as my understanding of Scripture, it appears that God's not against the oath itself. He's opposed to people who make an oath with the intent on deceiving another person. 
That's my understanding of the passage. Now, if you have a different conviction, you know what? Let, the scripture says in Romans, let each man be convinced in his own mind. Be convinced with what you should do or should not do. But if you're called into court, you know, um, you have to have a conviction about whether that's a problem or not. But, um, you know, I, I don't see that as a problem in court because among those who are close to us, we, we shouldn't have to have any type of oath because people know our character. They know who we are. But when you can step into a court, most of the time, you're not going to know anybody in that courtroom. They're not going to know who you are. And so the oath is just a, sort of a veracity of your, of your, uh, of your truth, that the fact that you're going to speak truth to them. Now, the swearing of oaths um, has its roots in the Old Testament at a time when written contracts didn't even exist. You know, the first oath ever recorded in the scripture was between Abraham and Abimelech. And, um, you know, basically it was over Abraham swearing an oath to Abimelech that, no, I dug these wells, and these wells are supposed to be used for my flocks and herds. Later we find that the two spies swore an oath to Rahab, and they said, look, you know, if you put this scarlet thread outside your window, you know, if your family's with you, you know, we, we, you will be spared. You know, they, they gave an oath to her. Many people swore oaths in the Old Testament. In fact, there were times when God even required a person to take an oath, to testify of their innocence in a situation. You see that in Exodus chapter 22. You see that in Numbers chapter 5. And so that oath reminds me of sort of the oath that's taken in court to saying, well, I'm going to verify that I'm telling the truth here. In ancient times, oaths were taken with the idea that if you broke that oath, you would incur the anger of God and therefore the wrath of God or the punishment of God. And so that's sort of the idea, I think, there. Now, James begins this with a negative because he talks about don't do this, don't swear this, don't take this oath, and all that. But then he moves to the positive. And he says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. James is reiterating the very words that Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, in, in, in doing so, he's telling us to simply be straightforward in our, and honest in our speech. You know, if you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. If you say, I'm not going to do this, don't do it. Keep your commitment short and simple, yes or no. You know, when we start adding words to what we say, we get ourselves in trouble. Proverbs says, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. You know, when we start running our mouth, we get ourselves in trouble. God doesn't want us to go around making commitments we can't keep. Have any of you ever made New Year's resolutions? <laughs> you haven't? Okay. How many of you have kept your New Year's resolutions? <laughs> That's why you're smart, right? <laughs> you know, I've tried to do that before, but you know, I, I, I am going to go to the gym every day this year. And before February's here, instead of circling the park at, a park at Planet Fitness trying to find a parking space, I am circling Krispy Kreme, wondering if the cops will catch me if I park in the handicap space. <laughs> you know? You know, it's one of those things. You, you, you just, you know, sometimes we, you know, we, we have the honest, most honest intentions, but you know, our flesh is weak. You know, the scripture says, you know, that God knows we're but dust. That's, that's what we are, right? You know, sometimes we break a commitment, though, because what happens? That commitment becomes inconvenient. It's not because we can't keep it. It's because we don't necessarily want to keep it. And, you know, I'm going to go on a diet. No more desserts for me. And then you get together with some friends, and you're eating out, and the waitress comes back, and she comes in for the kill. She says, does anybody want dessert? And then she holds out the menu, and there you see it, blueberry cheesecake, <laughs> manna from heaven, you know? And what do you say? Well, maybe just this one time. You know, the greatest Christmas card I ever got, it shows this picture of this really skinny Santa on the front of it, and he's standing next to the Christmas tree, and there's a table there with, with eggnog and cookies on it, and he goes, well, maybe just this one time. And underneath it says, Santa, the early years. You know, <laughs> how true, right? How true. So, so what do we do when, when it's not convenient for us to keep our word? I believe Psalm 15 deals with this issue. Da the Psalm that David wrote. David says this, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And then he answers that question. He who has integrity, he who works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Listen, 
who swears to his own hurt and does not change. I find that interesting. The righteous person is the one who swears to their own hurt and does not change. I like the way that the New Living Translation writes, uh, translates this. It says, the one who keeps their promises even when it hurts. You know, when we give our word to another person, we have to do everything possible that we can to keep our word. There may be rare occasions when circumstances prevent you from keeping your word, but then again, it's not a lack of desire to keep your word. You know, if, if you make a commitment to somebody, well, I'm going to come do this and all, and then on the way there, somebody runs into your car and you crash and, you know, you're involved in this accident, obviously you can't be there for them. You can't keep your word in that sense. But, but when we just sort of do it with a lack of convenience, that's when God's going to have an issue with that. And it implies that we should not make commitments without prayerfully considering them. You know, too many times, you know, somebody says, hey, will you do this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. You know, and I try to back people off. When I ask them to do something, I say, you know, I want you to think about this, consider it before you commit to it. But, but think about it through. And, and we have to be careful that we don't just make commitments flippantly without considering them first, especially prayerfully considering them. The Bible says once you um, have, a voluntary, uh, have voluntarily made a vow, be careful to fulfill your promise to the Lord your God. So, you know, when we volunteer to do something, we need to make sure that we fulfill what we promise because we're doing that in, before God. The Bible also says, do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. In other words, don't go and say to somebody, hey, you know, um, yeah, um, I'm going to help you move on Saturday and all. And then you get up Saturday morning and go, man, this would be a great day to go fishing. And, and, and then you bail on them because you'd much rather go fishing than move somebody. Well, everybody would rather go fishing than move somebody. I hate fishing. I'd still rather go do that than move somebody. I mean, you know, I mean, so, so, but it's talking about just being committed to what you're saying. So. You know, and, and I tried to instill this in my children when they were young because, you know, when they were in high school and, you know, all their friends at school would, hey, we're going to have a party or we're going to do this or we're going out and do this and all that. And they're like, hey, yeah, we're going to go do that and all. And, and one time, one of them made a commitment to do something and then another better commitment in their eyes came along and they told the other person, well, no, I'm not going to come to that because I, I can't make it. And I heard him on the phone saying that, well, I can't make it to what you're doing. And then I've heard him get on the phone to somebody else and say, well, they were going to something else. And I put a kibosh on that, and I said, I'll tell you what, from now on, you better think twice before you make a commitment, because when you give somebody your word to do something, you're going to keep that commitment. I wanted them to recognize it. That may seem like a small thing. Okay, well, so they're not going to go to this get-together with somebody, but they're going to go to this one over here. What's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. The big deal is that that begins to program in a person's mind that, hey, if something better comes along, I'll just go do that. And I don't really have to keep my word. My word's not important. You know what? I wanted my children to know that their word is their bond. And you know what? Throughout their lives, as they grew up, I always took them at their word. Sometimes I questioned it, but I took them at their word until it was proven wrong. Because I wanted to know, I'm going to put my trust in what you say, and I expect you to put your trust in what I say. And to build that confidence that they keep their word. And to this day, um, at least to my best of my knowledge, unless they're really lying through their teeth to me. No, no, but, uh, but seriously, they, they, they do. They keep their word. And I think that's important. Now, James concludes with a motivation for keeping our word. And this is really where it gets interesting. Um, James says, so that you may not fall under judgment. Now, remember at the beginning, he said brethren. So he was addressing believers. Here's where this passage is really interesting. Because he says, so you may not fall under judgment. Well, wait a minute. If you're a believer, you don't fall under judgment. You're, everything that you ever did that was wrong, every sin was judged on the cross by Jesus Christ. It was covered by his blood. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's covered. How could you fall into judgment? And so I looked at that, and I'm like, well, that's really interesting. So I did a little digging here. Now, the law of Moses warned, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. A very serious command there, Exodus chapter 20, um, part of the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, Jesus pronounced a woe in Matthew 23 against the Pharisees, which is like a, a woe is like a curse or a judgment, because of their false oaths. One way that a person takes the Lord's name in vain is by deceiving others with their words. And it's interesting because I went back and when I was looking at this verse, I'm like, but this doesn't really make sense because a believer doesn't fall into judgment, but he's calling them brethren, so what's going on here? The Greek word that James uses here for judgment is never used anywhere else in the New Testament as a reference to believers. 
because it speaks of an eternal judgment. The word for judgment uh, or for the chastening of believers is a different Greek word. It's peduo, and that's the one that's, that's used for when God chastens his children, disciplines his children. But this is a judgment of eternal judgment. So, so what is James saying here in this final portion of this, this sentence, this, this exhortation? I think James is giving us a sober warning that those who irreverently use God's name as a covering for their deception indicates that they are not truly believers. Now, that's a sobering thing to think about. Those who continue in this type of behavior face eternal judgment because the very fact that they are willing to draw God into something and they have no fear of the consequences of evil or deception indicates that they are really truly not walking with the Lord. So that's probably why he begins with this whole idea of above all. Now, as we wrap up this morning, before we take part in communion, I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to think back over any recent commitments that you have made to others, any times you have given your word to somebody else. And if you've neglected to keep that commitment, I want to challenge you to, or if you've been slow in keeping that commitment, I want to challenge you this week to do your very best to fulfill it, to do what you've said, to keep your word. And I also want to challenge you that when someone asks you to do something for them, before you immediately say yes or say no, that you pray about it. That you say, well, give me a little time, just a little time to think about this and what I should do. Because, you know, it's so easy for us to make commitments or even sometimes reject them and say, no, I can't do that. When maybe God does want us to rearrange our schedule and do that for that person. So, you know, God's faithful to keep his word to us. And we need to be faithful to keep our word not only to him, but to others. And, you know, that's the whole reason why we celebrate communion is because we believe God will be faithful to his word. What do I mean by that? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. A promise that we are very familiar with in Scripture. Jesus said, look, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm coming back. We believe... If we believe the scripture, we believe that Jesus is going to return sometime, sooner or later. Paul tells us, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, as, long, as often as we celebrate communion, what do we do? We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what that means is, when we take the bread and the cup today, we are living with the expectation that Jesus is going to keep his word to us. And we as believers, if we are going to represent Jesus truly, and accurately, we need to keep our word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, that is a challenge for us because we like to be liked by other people. And sometimes we can say things and not meaning to be dishonest. We can be dishonest because we don't want someone to be upset with us. They don't, we don't want them to be angry with us or we don't want them to not like us. And yet, Father, we need to be men and women who are characterized by honesty and integrity and in truth because that's a representation of who you are. And so, Father, this morning, as we take the bread and as we take the cup, as we enter into this time of fellowship with you, we pray that if there's any areas in our life where we have not kept our word and we have the ability to do it, that we would do that. Or, or that we would also be mindful that before we make commitments, that we make them before you and that we, we do that in a reverent way. Father, uh, bless this time together as we take the bread and cup in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
in the night where he was betrayed, he, he took the bread as he gathered those who were closest to him, those who had walked with him, those who had ministered with him, those who had ate with him, those who had seen the challenges that he went through. He took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same way Jesus took the cup, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Father, we, as we close this service, we are reminded of the promise of Jesus Christ to return for his church. And Father, we live with that expectation. We live with that hope that he will fulfill that word. We, we know in our heart of hearts that he will. And we don't know when that will happen, but until that time comes, you call us to occupy him, to, to be about the master's business. And so we may, may we be faithful in all that you've called us to do. May we live lives of integrity, of honesty. May we be those who are committed to the truth. And may others see that, and may it be an endearing force, a drawing force to them, to your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you.